Okay, now we're recording. Sorry about that. Once this is over, I will share this presentation and the recording of this so you guys can all take a check it out. So, are you going to do eggs? Really, you're going to get about 250 eggs per year for two or th the first, you know, three years or so, and then production will decrease after two years. Keep that in mind as we talk about this. This isn't like something you can just get and have for a few months. This is now going to be something you're going to deal with every day. So keep that in mind as we go along, and I'm going to remind you of that as we go along. This is an animal. Ethically, you need to see it every day. You need to take care of it every day. So keep that in mind, okay? Broilers are what we call meat birds, meat chickens. Those ones at the grocery store that you see that are about this big and come in a package. Most folks don't even know how to cook a whole chicken anymore. But if you do and enjoy cooking, it's a great way for you to get into uh, uh, more old school ways of producing and then cooking your own food. I have to mention fertilizer. We're gonna talk a little bit more about this, but you're gonna have at least 50 pounds of manure from each animal. That's a lot of manure. So what are you gonna do about that? You have to compost it and use this fertilizer. You can't just put chicken manure in your garden. One, it can contain salmonella and or E. coli, and make you sick. Two, it, it will burn your plants that has so much nitrogen in it. It's a great source of compost. It's a great source of nutrients. And it's a great thing to keep on your property. It's free. You're taking grain and you're turning it into compost. That's awesome. But you got to know what you're going to do with it because there's some people around you that are going to really have a problem with you stinking up neighborhood, namely your neighbors. And a lot of people ask me if chickens can eat ticks. And if, yes, they eat them like crazy. They are amazing animals and they eat tons of ticks. Oftentimes I hear that if people have chickens in their backyard, they don't have many ticks. And as someone who got Lyme disease last year and got it so bad, I seriously thought I had rabies um, that uh, I am definitely keeping an eye out for ticks and they've been terrible this year already. So another quick public service announcement, chickens poop on everything. This, you know, is a neglectful issue with these cages here, but that would be um, how much, as much poop as the chickens produce over the winter. And they poop a lot when they sleep. So just keep that in mind. You have to have a plan for what you're going to do with the manure. First and foremost, know your town code. Are you allowed to have chickens? I don't know. Look it up. Call your town board. Typically, what we recommend at Cornell and most people who have had chickens, if you're in a residential area and you're not zoned for ag, six hens, no roosters, period. Roosters don't just crow in the morning, they crow all day long and even sometimes at night, which is crazy. Um, they should be, you know, 50 feet from the property line typically. And if you can smell something, that means somebody else can typically. You have a problem. You can use your nose to really lead yourself and let you know if you're doing a good job with both keeping enough wood chips and carbon in your poop and your compost. And if you're doing a good job managing those animals overall. Keep it clean. Talk to your neighbors beforehand. And I just want to mention some things in this picture. This is not me. It's a great looking coop. But if you can see, there are lines here shooting across the screen. That is actually a fishing line or rope they put up to protect you from aerial predators, which are probably your biggest predator you're going to deal with. Uh, it's, it works really well to stop a hawk or an owl from jumping down in there and taking a bite out of your animals. Again, know your neighbors. Check with the town board. If there aren't regulations currently, I'm happy to write you a letter and uh, give my two cents on why you should be allowed to be more sustainable, why you should be allowed to go back to animal agriculture and understand your food system. I'm a big proponent of backyard chickens, as long as you're done responsibly. So tell your neighbors before you get the birds. Why not? Offer them free eggs, okay? Again, if you could smell it, you've got a problem already, and the neighbors are going to have a problem too. Um, and also, Leach it from your manure. If you do have a compost pile, this is just good standard practice for everybody. But if you do have that stuff washing into your neighbor's yard, you're gonna need to think about positioning that, that coop somewhere else or uh, maybe putting up some type of amendment to stop that water from flowing into their area, which contains manure and can be gross. But we don't wanna talk about this much, but I have to mention it, plan for end of life as it is now an ethical duty of yours to understand how to dispatch uh, injured or dying animal, period. If you have a dog attack a chicken or a rooster and it's on the way out, you need to know how to end its life. In the worksheet I'm going to send you all when this is over, I have um, a notice on how to do that. Um, it's not easy. No one likes to do it. And even if you're slaughtering, it's a very sacred and special thing overall. But you need to know how to do it, period. And don't have roosters. This is my rooster. I think his name was Rudy. I've had so many roosters, but he was an absolute terror. And we'll talk more about terroristic roosters. We are in this amazing times here. And so Corvid is a huge issue, also, but biosecurity is a huge issue for all livestock and animals. So, you know, I'm also going to give you a lot of links about this, but these are the six biosecurity tips that are just basic stuff. Keep your distance, keep away from other farms, keep away from other chickens if possible, 
keep it clean. We talked about that. Sanitary doesn't mean um, completely sterile. It just means, you know, neat and clean. Sterility, as we know, most of you probably imagine, is not always good for animals. We've run into some issues immunity-wise because we are so sterile and some of the food we eat is so sterile. I often end my newsletters saying, eat more dirt, and I mean it. Um, there's nothing like a little bit of uh, stimulation to get that immune system working again. But back to what I was talking about. <clears throat> Don't haul disease home. If you're gonna get equipment from somebody else, you're gonna pick up some equipment and bring it right to your place, wash it down. You know, three-fourths cup per gallon of, um, three-fourths cup of bleach or 10 parts per hundred of bleach in water is a perfectly good way to sanitize anything you bring home. Go bizarre and borrow disease from your neighbors. That means if you go to their chicken flock and let's say, even if they haven't been sick, you really should wash your shoes off to be best practice. It happens. Um, you will eventually get some sick chicken. Don't maybe know why, and I can guarantee you, you probably brought it back with you from somewhere else. Ethically, again, seeing your birds every day, seeing your animals every day, and know when they're sick. You're going to be out there. You're going to be giving them treats. You're going to be hanging out with them. You're not going to be kissing them, cuddling them, but you will know when something's wrong right away. Same with all animals. You know when something comes up and they're not acting right. And then you can always report sick, whether it's to me or whether it's to someone else um, that goes higher up. Cornell has special just a special um, way you can contact them and they will speak to you about really bad issues that you have on your farm. They're poultry experts or poultry health experts and I have it on a slide and I'll send it to you all when we finish this up. Oh, here it is right here, um, excuse me. The Animal Health Diagnostic Center at Cornell, you know they have an excellent vet center so they can really help you with all your needs. This will be in your slides and on your worksheet so you can contact them if you have an issue. If you just wanna call and talk to you, give me a ring. I'm happy to talk to you about what's going on in your place all the time. I love livestock and I love helping folks do stuff with livestock. So keep me on, um, on your email speed dial. <laughs> all right, still with this Corona stuff, we gotta get through this stuff first. Salmonella happens all the time. It's really, it can be deadly and so can E. coli. Chickens have been sharing coronavirus for millennia, along with pigs and us and bats and pangolins apparently. Um, this COVID-19 has not been found in poultry. That doesn't mean it isn't gonna um, uh, occur and mutate. The biggest thing you can do, like everybody else saying, is wash your hands. Wash your hands. Every time you go talk to your chickens, wash your hands. Chicken poop is nasty anyway. Chances are you're going to want to wash your hands because um, they're pretty gross. Don't be kissing on them. That's a great vector for you to suck in some salmonella or some other nasty little thing through your mouth. Um, know your birds if something is off. Call me if something's off. We might have to escalate it, but the point is that uh, you're going to know when something's wrong and then I can help you address it, okay? And then ultimately, don't visit other chicken sites in your clothes that you wear with your backyard chicken. It sounds tough, but once you have a problem, you're going to really uh, regret that you didn't do that. And also, I will say this, we'll talk a little more about this. Quarantine your animals for at least two weeks if you buy new ones and bring them in, especially as adults. Okay. All right. Finally, we can get started here now. We talked about biosecurity. We've talked about your responsibility as a poultry owner. And now we're going to talk about housing. You're going to need a coop. And I'm going to talk about the difference between a coop and their brooder in a minute here. You're gonna need about two feet per bird and about eight inches of roosting perch per bird. Chickens need to roost at night. That's how they're comfortable sleeping. There's this million different coop you can build. I'm huge into building them out of recycling materials. I've built multiple coops out of um, pallets. They work great. I have an equipment list in your worksheet I'm sending you, but really just basically you need a coop, you need feeders, you need a way to water them. You're gonna need some nesting boxes to keep their eggs clean when they lay them. And one nesting box is good for four birds. Oh, by the way, if you all are taking notes, don't worry too much about it because I'm going to send you this presentation. So just sit back and take all this in if you can, because this is more of a global thing than just, you know, telling you what you need to do. Like everything with livestock, um, it's, there's a lot of ethereal and a lot of like uh, strategy as opposed to just erudite and didactic learning that goes into actually raising an animal. So what I'm saying is you're going to get a feel for being a livestock farmer and or rancher. So... Those are the basic requirements of your coop. Like I said, there's about a billion different plans you can get online. So start digging and find something that you like. You can always buy one too at the store. Go for it. Um, they're expensive, but I always find it's more fun to make your own stuff anyway. Jason, can I interrupt you for one second? Yep, please We just do. had a uh, question. Someone has, uh, they wanted the definition of what a run is. Like what's a chicken oh, a run? run? is, you know, do you want to tell them, Ashley? Oh, yeah. So I guess uh, for me, it would just be like a fenced in area that, that the birds are in. Sounds good to me. It protects yeah. them. They're enclosed and uh, no one can get out. 
What it is really is if you have a chicken coop, you can free arrange your chickens in your yard, which I don't recommend unless you have a lot of space because they're gonna go in your neighbor's picnic table and they're gonna poop on it and they're gonna put their jelly sandwich on it and someone's gonna get in trouble. That's gonna be you. The run prevents the chickens from walking around your yard. It, ideally it can be movable, but if it's not, that's okay too. Any other questions we should get to right now, Ashley? Uh, no, I think that looks like that looks like it for right now. Great. Okay. So what type of chickens for eggs? Let's get into that now. What kind of chickens are you going to get? You can buy chicks. Uh, good luck. They're sold out as far as I know on all the online order forms for at least two to four weeks. Typically when you order chicks, they'll send at least, you got to order at least 25 because they send them in the mail. If you can believe it, they will send you a box in the mail. When the chick is hatching, the yolk, that piece that you eat out of the egg is their food. As they're growing inside that egg, that yolk becomes um, part of them. They suck it into their belly button and it's their food. So when a chicken's born, it doesn't need to eat or drink for about three days. And it can eat solid food and can drink water immediately. So typically they'll send only a number of 25 is the minimum they'll send in the mail because they need to stay warm while they're traveling in the air, if you can believe it. They'll come to the post office, you'll pick them up and boom, there's your chicks and you'll put them in the brooder. We'll talk about that. You can also buy pullets. Pullets are usually chicks that are about four to six months old and aren't laying yet, but are gonna start laying soon. Or you can just buy straight up adults. And there are breeders everywhere. And if you wanna find your local breeders, you can look on Craigslist, there's nothing wrong with Craigslist. But the gold standard is really an NPIP number, which is a National Poultry Improvement something program. And that means that they're registered and they're following the rules for good biosecurity practices and are a, a, you know, a reputable seller. I have known people that have bought uh, pullets or adults, 40 or 50 of them, they've all died within a week. Um, so just keep that in mind. So obviously it's best if you can raise chicks, but if you can get chickens that are coming from a similar environment of yours, feel free to buy those. Just remember again, with any animal, don't switch their feed right away. See if you can grab some of the feed that they're feeding there already and start mixing it with your feed if you're gonna change it up, okay? If you wanna buy organic, buy organic. It's typically double the price of conventional feed. A lot of their organic feed, bigger than organic, I don't care if you're organic or buy organic or not, buy local if you can. You find, if there's a feed mill in your area, buy from them. Um, if it is organic and they're getting their organic food or their grain from around, buy that. So just keep that in mind. Okay, back to uh, you. Yeah. I had one more question pop up, Jason. Um, there's an interest in deep litter compost for your coop and as a heat source for winter. Um, are there any blueprints available for how to build and advice? Yes, if you email me, I can email you an entire book on how to deep litter compost with your animals. So what they're asking is actually composting while the chickens are in the coop. I highly recommend it. I've done it many times myself. The biggest issue with composting is your carbon source. Most people are gonna use wood chips and they can get expensive. So uh, just email me please and I can give you a lot of resources because that's a little advanced and I didn't include that in this worksheet. So hey, Jason, can I jump in for two seconds? Mm -hmm. That's Rachel Moody, everybody. Uh, I'm with uh, Orange County Cooperative Extension and I do livestock there. Um, so just the NPIP is important because there are two diseases, Newcastle and Merrick's that will wipe out a whole flock. Um, that's the reason why you wanna look for that. Um, and then the other thing is when you do buy from other people, I've gotten this call multiple times from a lot of uh, small flock owners they want, um, when you buy pullets from other places and their birds were healthy, your birds were healthy, mm -hmm. two weeks, you put them together and then your birds end up dying off. Um, mm -hmm. Just keep in mind that, uh, you know, everybody's got their own germs and everybody's immune, immune system is used to their own germs. So sometimes those things just happen. Okay, thanks Rachel. I Rachel teaches the uh, beginning chickens course for Cornell Small Farms, and I have a link to their fall course, which will be happening this fall, which is a six weeks, really comprehensive course on beginning chickens and goes into more marketing and business stuff than we're gonna get into today. So thank you, Rachel. Um, and you guys, please feel free to jump in at any point, please. Um, obviously, if we're gonna be raising chickens up here, we want a cold hardy breed. There's a lot of traditional breeds in the area, whether they be Rhode Island Reds or Bard Rocks or New Hampshire's. So, um, it's your choice. There is a livestock breed conservancy that tells you the uh, numbers and the types of chickens that are less common now, and those can be really fun to grow. But I will give you this warning now, don't buy expensive animals to start off with. These are the animals you're going to make your little mistakes with, whether it's like Rachel was talking about and some died because you did some, you had some messed up with the biosecurity, 
whether your coop is a tight enough and you lose a bunch to a predator, don't buy these $500 starter animals. Get something that um, is cheaper and that is more hardy overall. Another thing with that too is most of those animals that are really expensive are propped up. By that I mean that they're fed the best food, they're coddled, they're kept indoors, and if you don't have exactly that system and you bring them home, they're gonna just fall apart. So, you wanna get some chickens. Here's some good layer choices for New York State. Uh, Americana, Aracana, there's different names for different breeds. They're the ones that lay different colored eggs and they're really cool. That's one on there, they have these fluffy cheek. Delaware, Dominiques, New Hampshire's, Plymouth Rock, Rhode Island Reds, Wyandots, all different kinds, all great breeds, all fun, up to you, or get a variety pack and just surprise yourself. Oh, one thing I didn't say yet, is if you're buying chicks, they're gonna come two different ways, either sexed or straight run. Straight runs, that means they pick up 10 chicks, they throw them in a box, they don't know how many boys and how many girls. If you're gonna buy cockerels or hens, you can choose which ones you want. Hens are always more expensive because they're the ones that are gonna lay eggs, whereas the cockerels are gonna be cheaper because they don't lay eggs. Those are gonna be your roosters. So that's um, just- I'm gonna pipe in a second too. Um, if you do live in a village where you do have to have only six um, chickens and you can't have any roosters, do yourself a favor. It's not 100%, but it's usually 90% accurate. Yeah. And buy, buy sexed um, birds, don't, don't go the cheap way and get the straight run because you'll end up with a bunch of roosters and you have to figure out how to get rid of them. Yeah, that's a great point. Thank you. Um, also, you're not going to have eggs for roughly six months if you buy chicks. So if you buy them now, you're not going to have eggs till like September. So keep that in mind. Um, yeah. As far as meat birds, those of y'all that want to grow meat birds, I love growing meat birds. I'm doing my own this year if I can find some. Um, the Cornish Cross is that big one on the end that looks like, you know, just a barrel with two legs coming out of it. That grows that big in, rough, in industrial settings in seven weeks. That animal's seven weeks old. It's that big. It's unbelievable. And just so you all know, a Cornish cross is just like a four-week-old one. They're not, or a Cornish hen, excuse me, is not a special bird. It's just a four-week-old bird. Freedom Rangers in the middle there, that's a faster-growing hybrid between a, a heritage and a fast grower, 9, 11 to 12 weeks. So keep in mind, these birds are much better foragers. The Cornish cross, that big white one, has just been bred to eat, poop, and grow. It doesn't really have a lot of instincts left. It's not genetic manipulation. They've done this by selective breeding. It's pretty amazing that that chicken has gained, you know, six pounds and what we could grow in the 50s just through selective breeding. The Freedom Ranger is a much better forager, but if the best foragers, the best predator uh, averse animals are gonna be your heritage breeds, your dual purpose breeds. Those ones that are gonna be used for meat and eggs. So typically what'll happen in my house is we'll get some laying hens every year, we'll have them for two years, and then in that two years we'll, we'll slaughter them and have them as stew birds in our freezer. Um, and those tend to have the most flavor in them without a doubt. Once you raise your own chickens and eat it, not only is the process rewarding, but the, I feel that the taste and the actual experience of eating that bird is much more rewarding and tastier. So if you wanna do meat birds, that's what you gotta look for. Where to get them? These are sick animals. These don't look good. One's got pox, obviously. I think the one on the top has Newcastle disease. There's a million um, hatcheries out there online. Most of them are centered in Amish country in Ohio and Pennsylvania. Uh, it's really fun to get the chicken catalogs every spring, just like your seed catalogs. I highly recommend it to look at them and dream and see what you want to get. So hatcheries and breeders, like Rachel said, are NPIP certified. You know, they're disease free. You can decide if you want to have them vaccinated, up to you. There's other places too. We all know Tractor Supply, your local feed store has chicks, although I've heard those are sold out too at this point for this year. Um, those tend to be pretty good. Clubs also, you tend to be NPIP certified. And um, if you want to contact your local 4-H people, I know if you type in online too, NPI piece has a list of chicken um, breeders in New York State, if y'all are in New York, and you can call those people online or look on Craigslist. I don't recommend swap meats or back of the truck stuff. You don't know what they are typically, and uh, they can bring home a lot of diseases for you. So your best bet is go online and look at those hatcheries. If not, contact your local suppliers and see what they got available. I did see a Craigslist ad yesterday. They were like 10 different kinds, and that's really cool. That's fun. Real quick, just the difference here between a brooder and a coop. A brooder is our first, is our first thing we're going to do. That's a picture of one. I think he's got too many lights in there, that person, but it's okay. It takes the place of the mama hen. When they're born, the chickens aren't feathered. They're little fluff balls, and they can't keep regulate the temperature, and they can, they're not waterproof. So this little thing and that heat lamp acts like the mama bird. You need chick size supplies. The chicks can't typically eat or drink out of the big ones, okay? Out of the adult size feeders and waters. They're gonna need at least one heat lamp. I'll talk more about heat lamps in the next slide. The coop is for adult birds. So, 
And that's really just to shelter them from the rain, protect them from predators, and give them a place to sleep because chickens at night are like zombies. They're just there. You can go in there, they won't fly away. You can pick them up. They're, I think the word is torbid. But anyway, you can really do whatever you want to them. So they're very, really vulnerable to predators, obviously, when they're roosting at night. And you don't need lamps for adult chickens. If an animal is allowed to acclimate to the cold temperatures in New England and New York like it should, it will have no problem getting through the winter generally if it has a draft free coop. Chickens are where they have fat on them. They're not a human. It's, it makes it a mistake to uh, anthropomorphize an animal and its ability to regulate its own temperature. And often a light will cause more trouble than it's worth because it messes with their hormones and their pituitary gland and their laying and all the other stuff that chickens need to do and do it with nature's light. So just keep in mind that's the difference between a brooder and a coop, everybody. So here's what you need for your brooder. Here's one of my little guys from my place for a couple years ago. You only need about a half to one foot of space per chick in there. I mean, your chick water, your chick feeder, and your chick food, because it's gonna have a different protein level as they're growing big and strong in the beginning. You need litter in there. Most people use um, sawdust or fine wood chips so you get a tractor supplier, your favorite supplier, obviously. But be careful at first, because sometimes the birds will start eating that. Um, if it's too fine, they'll think it's food. And if you're gonna use um, newspaper, which I typically do it for the first week or so, um, you kind of have a problem with called what's called slayed leg where the, they can't get a grip. So just keep in mind if you start to see them not be able to stand up and walk around, you might have an issue with that. Get two heat lamps in case one burns out because you don't want your chickens dying overnight. And set up your brooder before they come. Put that lamp on, shine it in there, and make sure it doesn't light a fire and make sure that it's safe. The animals can't touch it or knock it over or your toddler can't or one of your pets can't. Um, and don't put your feed directly under the lamp. Put it away from the lamp. And I'm going to show you some pictures why that is. Here's one here. I have had this happen to me. Not my place, but I've had a fire in my brooder. Um, what typically happens is the light bulb cracks and falls and will light a fire in that dander. Um, so you can buy a safety light, which is what I use exclusively now. They're about four times the cost. They're like $40, $50. But that peace of mind is worth far more than the thought of my house burning down at night. So I highly recommend you look at the safety lights. And again, test it before you don't get the chicks at 6 p.m., put them in there and then go to bed. You need to keep an eye. Jason, can I interrupt uh, yeah. really quick too and just say that I have the same fears for sure. And so one thing I started using was like the heat plates that you get from Premier. Yep. And they, um, they've been pretty great for me too. I just, uh, they use a little electricity and I think they're a little safer. The chicks go underneath them. So it's supposed to mimic the mother hen. Um, yeah. So just, just another option out there. Yeah, that's great. They do, but it actually, does it get really dirty with poop? Uh, you know, so they, so it's, it's flat or you can get like, it's kind of like a guard that's like a dome on top. Oh, and, a dome um, on. Yeah, so I, I bought the guard, like the dome, because if oh, not yeah. for sure, they'd get on it and just like cover it with poop. But if you have that dome, then it's totally fine. Cool. And you don't want to have these guys in your house because let me tell you what happens. You put a lamp on a bunch of chicken manure, that chicken manure very quickly becomes dust it floats around your whole house. Don't mess with them in your house. It is too dirty and too nasty and it's too, too much risk between pets, toddlers, and then disease in your house. So I mean, maybe a day or two is okay, but you know, between the fire risk and all the other stuff that goes along with having live, this many live animals in your house. Definitely not. I've done it okay. with only 20 chicks and it was so dusty and I do not recommend it. Yeah, it gets nasty. I actually have nine birds in a room right now in my house because of COVID. I had to take foster some and it's been uh, interesting. It's been too cold to really let them out this week. So doing all I can. Here's the temperature recommendation. But the point is the quickest you quicker you can wean them off that light, the better they'll be. That chick there in my friend's hand is a puffball. It doesn't have feathers that can't shed water and it can't keep itself warm. So you know that it's going to need a light. But as soon as those feathers start growing in and they will start growing in within days, then you can start weeding them off that light by putting it further and further away and leaving it off during the day and only have it on at night. <laughs> I know that Rachel and Michelle use this picture too, and I like it because it shows you your brooder lamp. You know, I'm talking about the stuff on the left here. You can tell if your temperature is too high because the birds are all on the outside. If it's correct, they're all going to be sleeping, playing, pooping, whatever they're doing. If it's too low, they're going to be huddled right underneath the light, and if there's a draft, there's going to be, they're all going to be in one corner. These birds are just afraid of the person inside their coop. So that's why they're all hiding. This is a good example of a typical, in this picture, a typical heat lamp that's, that is dangerous. Like I said before, if that 
the chickens don't really have a lot of guard, guard there. If they jump up, they can hit it. And that's what happens, honestly, is typically that bulb will shatter, fall into those wood chips, then you have a fire. So keep that in mind. So again, this is all for your brooder. We're not quite into coop yet. Um, also, Jason, just one of the reasons why you don't want them all huddled together is um, they're not very smart creatures and they're also babies. And so when they're all huddling together, they tend to trample each other and you will get uh, injured or even um, dead ticks. Yeah. yeah, they can suffocate. So that's a great point. That's why you actually, if you're going to go big with this, talk to me. If anybody's going to start doing a few hundred chickens, let's talk. But if you are going to go big, you need to put baffles in your brooders because they will pile up at times. So I can talk to you about that. The coop. So now we're out of the brooder. Let's say we're at like six, eight weeks. It's warm. It's May. It's June. It's summer. We're ready to come out into our coop. The coop really needs to have proper ventilation because heat is really detrimental to an animal too. And also um, moisture is an animal's worst enemy. So if you have cold and wet, you're in trouble. But if you have just wet and just cold, you're just fine. So keep that in mind. It's got to be predator proof. And um, there's things that you won't even think of like rats that will eat your chickens. I, um, depending on the time of year, because there's all that wood chip, they want to live in there. So as predator proof as you can make it um, is your best bet. And it can withstand the weather. Remember, we get some serious storms here. In fact, we had thunder and lightning in my house last night. If you have heavy snow or if you have high winds, it can easily rip the roof or flip over one of your, uh, your coops. So keep that in mind. And enough space for all the chickens to lay their eggs and rest. Like I said, one nesting box is fine for four chickens each, but they need roosting bars. They need an eight that one foot of space to sleep at night. Now, a lot of people will stagger them so some are higher than the others or they'll go flat out. The highest ones will be taken up by the most dominant chickens. By the way, that's where the word pecking order comes from. Your chickens are gonna fight, they're gonna establish an order, and that's the way it is. If there is one beaten up on, um, you know, you can remove that animal, but the next one in line is just gonna become that low person on the totem pole. Again, sensitive topics, bullying, injuries, protection, safety. These are all sensitive topics that chickens allow you to breach and talk about with kids and adults um, and the word pecking order and what that means. So just keep that in mind. They need to have the space. If you don't have enough space, you're just inviting stress and stress means aggression. Okay. Why not use a portable coop? Wow, what a great idea. Here's Mr. Joel Salton down in Virginia with his portable coops. I love portable coops. I've built many in my life. I'm building another one for my backyard this year. Why? Because you don't have to move that 50 pounds of manure per laying hen every year. You can let it go out on the pasture or on your grass and fertilize. Now, you have birds this size out there for a day or two, you're not going to want to walk behind it anytime soon. You need to give it time for that manure to incorporate into the ground, so keep that in mind. But beyond that, you also let them um, forage. They're going to be eating all the bugs out there. And make no mistake, animals, every animal eats grass. It's a tonic for them. It cleanses them. Um, and it's a natural. You know, I know your dogs do it when you have them out there. And chickens will eat a lot of grass too. Um, so give them that opportunity. Now, there are some downsides to the portable ones that they can be more vulnerable to predators at times. You'll look behind Joel here, you'll see he has electro netting up. It's a portable charger with electro net. He has a lot of problem with bears and coyotes there. But, uh, you know, it's, it's serious. You need to think about how you're going to do that. Daily chores take much longer because you're not just going out there and moving one feeder, you're moving multiple feeders. So let's just say that Joel has 20 of these out there. There's five gallons of water. He's going to need to bring 100 gallons of water out there with him just to fill those 20. So how's he going to get that out there every day? So just keep that in mind. But if you can go portable, it is by far your best bet, in my opinion. Manure, again, I can't talk about this enough because it's such a serious thing. Here are my legally procured milk crates that I used um, to build my nesting boxes. They're a little small, but they work fine for me. If you look in the front of this picture, you'll see there's a board in the front so the egg doesn't roll out once it lays. 150 to 500 pounds of manure plus your bedding material makes two to 700 pounds of waste per year. You need to figure out what you're gonna do with that. Um, your nesting boxes can be filled with all different types of things, but no matter what, you're gonna need to have a plan to do that. That's called a manure management plan. Me or Rachel or Ashley or anybody else involved with Cornell can help you come up with a way to compost and or um, maybe even give that waste away to someone who can incorporate it and use it on their house. Um, cleaning the coop and thoroughly disinfecting the coop is important. Again, it doesn't have to be sterile. We're just sanitizing it and making it a little bit better. We're cleaning all the old poop out. You know, that coop is a living organism too. In that house, your animals are living in there and all the other creatures that inhabit the inside and the outside of them are there too, making their home. So that coop is a living, breathing object. It's pretty neat. Um, and again, if you're pasturing and moving the coops, that won't be such an issue. The manure will fall on the ground. 
give it a couple days to incorporate. And what's really neat is if you have one in your yard or in your pasture, you will see where that poop has been because the ground, the grass will be so green from the nitrogen flush and the uh, waste from the chickens. It's really cool to see. You can look at pictures of that. As far as feed goes, I talked about the organic, non-organic debate. Buying local is always best, but there's different feed for different classes of your livestock. So your starter feed for the first eight weeks or so is higher protein level because they're growing so quick. There's a grower feed and there's a laying ration. Um, it's up to you. It says here for six layers, eating two pounds of feed a day total, um, a, you'll have to have buy 15 bags a year. So a bag's 10 bucks. So right off the bat, it's 150 bucks. Don't store your feed long. It can mold. It can kill your animals through myotoxins. Um, if you have hanging feeders, put them up to the height of the back of the chickens. That's how they can reach their head and then eat. You got to have feeders. If you throw food on the ground, it'll rot. It'll get nasty. Uh, it's just not a good practice. Have a nice clean feeder. You can use trowel feeders. I have some really old ones that I've used for years for multiple birds, but uh, make sure they can't poop in it. Because any board they find, they will stand on the edge of and they will they'll roost there and poop. So if they are out in the grass, you'll be amazed. I've seen chickens eat entire swallow whole snakes. I've seen them eat whole meadow mice in one bite. They're omnivores. And when you see the label, I always find it so crazy that it says vegetarian chickens. What does that mean? Chickens are vegetarian. And forcing them to be one, I feel like it's kind of cruel and unusual. Um, so having chickens being able to express themselves and eat bugs and do what omnivores do is a great thing overall. Don't be afraid though when your yolks are bright red. The extra beta carotene they're taking in from the pasture and from that grass tonic is going to cause their yolks to turn bright, bright yellow, excuse me. I mean, even orange. Um, there can be a little off-putting at first. It scares people when they first see it. So um, here's some coop designs. Like I said, there's a million that you can think of. I mean, it's so many different kinds. That caged area is the run. That's where they can come out and kind of be themselves without being worried about picked off by a predator. The coop itself is the, is the wooden part. Now, some of these have things on the sides where the nesting boxes are to remove eggs. They have ways you can open it up to get um, some airflow through there. This person just made a geo, used a half a geodesic buckyball to make theirs. That's cool. Um, I'd be a little worried about that getting flipped over, but you know, they got to have shade. Keep that in mind. We'll talk a little bit more about that later, but the coop is just whatever your imagination can come up with. Okay. Jason. Um, okay, so just uh, just to keep in mind, um, for when you are storing your feed, try to make sure that it's in a metal container or some sort of good um, secure area because uh, unfortunately with chicken feed comes rodents and they will gnaw through plastic. So just remember what you're storing your feed in. That's great. Thank you. Yeah, it's, you need a place to store it and not more than a month, really two weeks, I would say. Um, chicken coop needs, or, or chicken water needs, excuse me, I think that's what it says. You got to have water at all times, even in winter. In winter, you can buy yourself an electric water that will allow you to, it'll keep the water from freezing. Um, or if you really are motivated and you don't have the way to get electricity out there, you can head out there and continually bring them more water. Um, they drink about two cups a day when they're big and grown. That's a lot. It goes quicker than you think. They prefer water between 50 and 60, but they can adapt to water. Um, and even sometimes you'll find them just drinking out of puddles and stuff, but if you give them um, clean water, they usually will drink out of that and they'll be okay. A lot of people like to use apple cider vinegar in their waterers because it prevents algae. <laughs> apple cider vinegar, some people think it's a great tonic. I'll say this, and anything that is holistic is great for prophylactic stuff. Before you have a problem, if you want to add garlic, if you want to add diatomaceous earth on the outside of those animals, if you want to add apple cider vinegar to their feet. That's great, but when you have a real problem, you need to use a real solution to treat it. It's unethical to not treat these animals correctly. So yeah. they have to use antibiotics. We're lucky that we even have them, but you need to care for these animals um, in the best way that you know possible. So if you are gonna use holistic stuff, great, go for it. Just keep in mind, if things get serious, you need to um, bring in these uh, proven techniques. To and and you, have some, you have some questions, Jason. What's that? You have some questions in the chat. Oh, okay. Let's see if I can open my chat here. Um, thank you. Okay, uh, so uh, gravity feeder that came. How do you provide water? So I talked about how you provide winter with water to your chickens without it freezing. No big deal there. Is softened water safe for chickens to drink? I don't know the answer to that. I would look that up online. I've never had to, I've never had hard water. I know they add minerals to it. So I would look that up because it could maybe possibly cause some problems to their um, 
their system, where there's too much calcium or something. Okay, these are some different chicken waters. The top, my left or your right or whatever, is a bell waterer. Those are what you saw Joel changing out. The bottom is just a simple waterer for one or two chickens. There's PVC pipe ones. There's the old school metal gravity feeders. And this person's put up, these are called chicken nipples at the bottom of that big um, 50 gallon barrel. Or there's cup feeders up here on the top one. They work great, they're super clean because chickens and ducks especially will spill water everywhere if they can at times. So those work out really well. But again, as much as your imagination can come up with, you can do whatever you want. Supplementing your chickens. Like everything else, there's a very robust market for selling you everything you're probably chickens don't need, but you'd like to give them. The best thing you can give a chicken is a chance to forage and grass because that's what all it really wants in life. And that's what it loves to do. It's the most stimulating thing in their life um, and a place to rest and lay eggs. But you can buy scratch for them, it's okay. And oyster shells are cool if they're not gonna be able to get enough um, calcium from the eco-skeletons eco of the uh, bugs they're eating and have access to. You can feed table scraps. Typically that's what these layers are for, but only give them enough to clean up in 20 minutes. There's a couple reasons. One, because of botulism and they can get nasty and rotten. Two, if there's extra stuff laying out there, it's gonna attract all kinds of other vermin that you don't want. Um, and three, if you're giving them a whole bunch of vegetables to just eat and they don't have enough protein, they're gonna get sick. Their laying will go down and they will lose body condition. They'll get sick, so keep that in mind. Uh, but there is many, I mean, you don't have to believe the hype. If you wanna go buy special worms or whatever, because you love your chickens, that's great. That's great, but again, the best thing you can do is give them access to free range and be themselves and uh, forage, if you can do that. Hey, Jason, there was a question on, um, just going back to coops, uh, if you build a coop, whether you, it should be insulated or not. And I wanna let you answer that before I give my two cents. <laughs> I mean, you won't want any drafts in there. You can insulate it if you want, but the problem with that is it's gonna contain, it's gonna hold the moisture in there. And we know that moisture is the enemy of animals when they're cold. So you really wanna have ventilation at the top of the coop because chickens put off a lot of moisture and a lot of heat, surprisingly and allow that moisture to escape. Also because of heat, uh, I'm not a fan of it only because they can huddle together to get warm, but in the, in the warmer temperatures, um, heat stress is a real issue for chickens. And if you have an insulated coop, it's really hard for them to um, get away, you know, to get cool enough. That's true, yeah. So yeah, you don't need to insulate the coop, but you need to make sure there's no drafts in there. That's just more important to overall. Thank you. Um, scheduling for absences. We, I've mentioned this a couple of times. Here's a picture I took when I was in Venice with a couple of my chickens that I took. And uh, if you can't take them on vacation with you, you're going to have to do morning afternoon chores. So, you know, quick morning looks like this. And I'll tell you what, this should be the, one of the best parts of your day. If you're not getting joy from taking care of your animals and doing this process and learning and being part of their lives, and it's not something for you. A lot of people want us to become farmers and all this stuff and ranchers and that, that's great and all and I really support it but if it's not the best part of your day then quit and find something else to do. You're going to get up you know let them outside if they don't have an automatic door which I highly recommend. I love automatic doors. They open up with the sun and then come and go as they please um, and they'll keep their predators out. You're going to feed the chickens, give them water, scrape the dropping board if you have one. When the chickens sleep they poop at night. If you put a board under them you can easily clean that up daily and put it in a bucket and move it somewhere instead of having to clean up all this hundreds of pounds of chicken poop that's gonna collect over a week or a month. So keep that in mind. Afternoon, you can come back, collect your eggs. If it's cold, collect them more, or really hot, collect them more often. Um, and then close them up for the night. And then monthly, clean out your water is really good because you're gonna collect algae, aerate the bedding down there if you need to, move the coop maybe if they're gonna make, because they will make a dead zone. If you have chickens anywhere for just a few weeks, they're gonna eat all the grass and eat all the bugs and scrape it a lot. They will become a moonscape. That's why if you can move them, you're really better off overall. Um, and then, you know, keep in mind now, what will you do when you're gone? When you go on that two-week vacation in the Adirondacks, who's going to wash your chickens? Most people have a neighbor, something they can trust, or maybe they give them free eggs, or maybe they pay them a couple bucks a day to do that for them. But you need to plan for that from now on, because it's really important. You can't just leave a bunch of food and water to your chickens. You need to see them every day. Predators. Oh, boy. Everything is going to try to eat your chickens. They're not native to this country in the form that we have them. Um, they're not, they don't retain the instinctive drive to hide and fight from predators. So they're really a, uh, a target for everything out there, ground, air, everything. Neighborhood dogs are one of the biggest ones. Uh, so keep that in mind if there's a nasty dog or even a, sorry, not even a nasty dog, it's a prey drive. If there's any dogs around you, 
you got to introduce them slowly and easily and get them used to the animals and train them to not kill your pet. So here's some predators. There's a million. I like the picture of the fox actually eating a chicken in the photograph. It's probably from a livestock camera, but in the daytime, typically it's going to be dogs, foxes, and hawks. In the night, raccoons, which are really nasty sometimes, possums, owls, coyotes, and fishers. I don't see many coyote problems typically. Um, the biggest one that I lose animals to are hawks and owls in the early morning and late evening. And weasels. And eagles. Anything in the weasel family. Oh, weasels, yeah. I haven't had a lot of problems with that, but I do hear it reported at times. Um, the best defense is having a good coop. It's as simple as that. They make chicken wire for that reason. I talked earlier about rats and mice getting in. They typically will take your chicks and bury them in the litter to be eaten or consumed at a later time. If you have a predator issue, look online. There's a million different ways to stop them. Um, but protection, full protection is the best way. You are going to lose animals to predators, I guarantee it, poultry to predators, because again, everything is out to get them. Um, actually, Rachel, do you want to talk about some of the health issues here? Because you're an expert on this stuff in vaccinations. Can, can we use the term expert loosely here? <laughs> <laughs> yes, yeah, sorry. I've just done this presentation a lot. <laughs> yeah. Um, I guess. I mean, we've already, you've already talked about the uh, some of the well, just the biosecurity and stuff. But um, put me on the spot here. Vaccinating yeah. for Merricks and Newcastle. Um, for those of you who are interested in organic, this is this has more to do with if you plan on selling eggs and and whatnot. But I've had this question: um, organic chicks and chickens are considered organic at day two just so that they can actually get vaccinated for Merricks and Newcastle um, because it is so important that they uh, <laughs> have that vaccine. Um, he already talked about quarantining all new birds for at least two weeks. Uh, it's not a full-on guarantee, but it does definitely help. Um, parasites, internal and external, there's a lot of different ones. Um, if you are going organic, or even if you're not, uh, the apple cider vinegar trick is just a little bit in water, does help, like Jason said, prevent or help um, against it. It makes their system acidic. Um, so the, the parasites don't care for that type of an environment. Um, but it, it's not, you know, it's not like a catch all and it's not gonna save everything. Um, if they do get parasites, you do wanna treat them for it. And you also need to make sure when you're treating an animal for anything, if you're gonna, if you're eating the eggs, make sure that it's safe. If you're not sure, you need to contact. Uh, well, first of all, read the label of whatever they're getting treated with, but also contact any of us or a veterinarian um, just to be on the safe side. Uh, coccidia is awful. It's a protozoa. Um, it they get really bad diarrhea from it. It it is common in not just chickens, but in a lot of um, animals. Um, there are, again, there are ways to. Uh, to treat it and also to prevent it. Lice and mites, um, I don't care who you are, you're going to get mites and it usually happens every year. Every farm I go to almost, yeah. Um, leg mites especially, but there are again ways to help with treating them. Um, you'd think that birds that like to pick you know, bugs, you'd think that they'd pick them off themselves, but it's not that easy. <laughs> yeah. um, and, and again, just prevention. Um, the best thing you can do for your birds is you know, they are very comical to watch. They're very entertaining, um, but just be aware of them and, and what they look like normally so that yeah. you can pick up any signs of um, them acting differently or, you know, hey, they're missing a couple of feathers. Why are they missing feathers? Um, that's the best thing you can do for them just to make sure that uh, you're, you catch things as soon as you do. Um, and keeping things clean and dry is for sure um, a good way to prevent a lot of bacteria and any kind of things that, um, you know, that could be an issue for them. Um, cool. Upper respiratory issues are just another thing to keep. I, I, we can't list everything in this whole entire time, but just, you know, do your homework and upper respiratory issues tend to be um, something that chickens get a lot of as well. Yeah. And, you know, <laughs> she's right. They are everywhere. And, uh, you know, finding one or two mites is not a bad thing in your animals. Again, we talked about a healthy immune response. There are other creatures living with them inside and out them. So a couple of them is not bad, but if you see a behavioral change or if you see a physical change in an animal due to mites or something, that means they've hit a threshold where it's unhealthy for the animals. That's what you need to treat. If you need help understanding where that threshold is, I'm happy to talk to you about it. But like Rachel said, 
the best way to understand it is to see your animals every day to know that if something else is causing to make a behavioral or physical change that you need to treat it. Thank you. Cold weather. You could knit a sweater for all your chickens, but I don't recommend it. They're wearing a perfectly fine down coat with fat underneath it and they're very well insulated. But the biggest thing is to keep your water from freezing. They need to have water at all times. They can't eat and digest without water. Their heart's beating a lot quicker than yours. They're gonna eat and drink much more frequently than we do. They need to have water with that. Um, you can insulate with extra bedding. If someone asked about composting bedding, which will actually generate its own heat, which is great if you do it correctly. Not always easy to compost. Um, you can add a little bit of extra scratch to their diet because in the winter, there's not gonna be bugs around. and They're not gonna have access to grass, so keep that in mind. Behind clean water, I think drafts is your next worst thing that can get them. You will get frostbite on your animals, especially roosters in the winter. They're not native to this country or cold weather. They're from Indonesia. We've also bred them to have very large combs and waddles, and they will get frostbite. My advice is leave it be. If it gets frostbite and that animal's healthy, it will recover fine. If you go put Vaseline on it or anything else, you're just gonna introduce a vector of disease in Paris or whatever, some type of infection to that wound. So keep the wound clean, but leave it alone. If the animal's healthy, it'll take care of itself. And it will, if you have a rooster with a, you'll see it, it'll have some cold injury. One, you may need to check to make sure you don't have drafts, but typically hens will sleep with their head down and roosters sleep with their head up. So they're just more vulnerable to that cold air on them. Um, it'll fall off, turn black and fall off, and then it'll recover. And you probably won't even notice any of the damage. And hopefully the next year it won't happen again. Use windbreaks to your advantage, obviously. And you can take water out at night. They're not going to be eating and drinking at night. Remember, I told you they're like zombies. You will notice this as we go along. It's pretty cool. Um, so if you don't want the water to freeze overnight, and once they all go to bed, you can come take it out and refill it up in the morning. So lights in the coop, I don't recommend, again, because it's going to cause pituitary. It's going to stress that animal out. If you want to learn how to use lights responsibly, let me know. It's for advanced chicken growers, and it takes a lot of work to do it just right. But you can actually increase your productivity for the chickens if you want to use lights in your, in your model. Like Rachel said, water. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Oh, no, I was just going to say, um, as cute as that picture was with the sweater on the chicken, I don't recommend anything like that at all because what people forget is that animals like your dogs, animals like your chickens, they all are designed with a type of, um, their feathers do a job for, you know, and, and they do a job well. And so if they can't fluff their feathers to get air underneath their feathers, it's not, not going to keep them any warmer. So just let a chicken be natural, like Jason's been saying. Cool. That's great. Thank you. Totally oh. great. If I think could snag on something, that animal is going to, we will die of thirst within hours. We, we have a question oh, thanks, to um, the Merricks in Newcastle. Do you need a vet to do the vaccination? Or is that something that you can do yourself? And how much would it cost? You can do it yourself, but 99% of people don't. The hatchery will do it for you. And if they are from an NPIP approved um, flock, then they will let you know if they've been vaccinated. And usually it costs between 10 and 25 cents per bird to have them vaccinated before they come to you, shipping it to you. But the, the problem too is that the dosages come in for like a thousand birds. So yeah. whenever you buy the medication, it's good for a thousand birds. So if you have less than a thousand birds um, raising, it's really not worth it for you to buy it just to give six birds the um, the shots. Um, so yeah, yeah, it's it really just it's just best to to either buy from a closed flock or um, or the MPIP flock. That's a great point. Cool. Um, hot water and and Rachel mentioned this is just as bad for animals as cold weather, if not worse, in my opinion. Hot water can really decimate animals. Chickens are pretty good. These are actually a picture of chickens panting. And I think this is some chickens I had. Um, but you gotta have cool water and you gotta have shade. That's part of the coop's job is to keep them cool. And like we were talking earlier, the insulation can retain heat and moisture. We don't want that either. If it's really hot, if it's like over 85 degrees, especially when raising broilers, meat birds, I won't feed them during the hottest part of the day. If you digest food inside your system, you create heat from the inside and that just makes you hotter and hotter. So we'll withhold feed during the hottest parts of the day. Um, that's just during the, the really hot times. Um, again, airflow is your friend in the summertime. And uh, if you have birds out in the grass, make sure the grass is low. Because sometimes I see folks with chicken tractors and the grass is high and it doesn't allow the wind to get to them. They can open up their feathers and let air get to them all over that skin. That, and they will, uh, they will shed heat like a human does when they get that air on them. And it's possible. 
egg handling, if you're going to be having eggs, keep it safe, man. I mean, keep this in mind. If you don't, if you, so the chickens will poop in their nesting box if you let them. The way to stop them from doing that is to close them up at night. Don't let them sleep in the nesting boxes. If you see them in the box at night, come in and physically pick them up and put them on their roosts. Um, and you can also make contraptions that you can put down over the nesting boxes so they can't even get in there. So after you collect the eggs for the day and it's late at night, or when you go close them up for the night, you can shut off the boxes so they're not sleeping in there. <laughs> Keep your nesting materials clean. If you have poop and nasty stuff, I mean, your eggs are gonna have nastiness on them. Typically, and this is not for selling, you guys are just using these eggs for yourself. Only wash the eggs that you have to. If you have a good system beforehand, you're not gonna have dirty eggs. If they're laying in the box, if they have clean bedding material in there, and they're not sleeping in it, you're gonna have generally clean eggs. But remember, that egg comes out of the chicken's cloaca. That means common hole. Feces, eggs, urine is part of their feces, all come out of there. So there's a great chance that you could have some um, foreign material or unwanted material, i.e. poop, on your eggs. So just clean them dry. Don't put water on them because if you get them wet, it'll close up the pores and it will make them more likely to get nasty and real bad. So just scrape off the manure you have there. And obviously cook everything to spec. It's a great way to keep yourself safe from salmonella and E. coli if you're cooking your food correctly. Um, if you're in a storm in the US, we store our eggs in the fridge. In Europe, they're not even allowed to store eggs in refrigeration from what I understand, but that's because they handle them differently. We wash all of our eggs right out of them in industrial settings, but here you should avoid doing that, okay? And I have all kinds of stuff for you to read about keeping yourself safe in your newsletter or your, the page I'll send you. Children and chickens. This is actually a picture of my uncle Walter when he was a little kid at our, at our farm, our family farm. Um, but again, they're great for all ages. They help teach responsibility, introduce sensitive topics, life systems. You go, you're going to see it all. Life, death, poop, everything. Um, money and marketing is another good point too. And chickens are relatively safe as long as you're washing your hands after you interact with them, that you're not kissing them, but they can be dangerous. And I think I got a picture here. Um, the picture in the middle is a, um, is a chicken spurs. That's a rooster spurs. That's how they do damage. They're big. You will at some point have an aggressive rooster and there's ways you can deal with it. That rooster thinks you're another rooster. It thinks you're a rival. Don't act like one. Don't stare at it. Don't make eye contact. Don't make yourself puff up and get big and don't chase it. Okay. And also don't run away and scream because that's what roosters do. They yell as loud as they can. Don't act like a rooster. What you got to do is back away. Don't run. Start bringing it snacks when it's acting appropriately. Now, don't give it snacks if it attacks you. But if you're out there and he's, he's being good and active right, throw him a little snack. Give him something, a treat. Because other roosters don't give other roosters treats. And they'll stop associating you and think of you as another bird. Also, an old timer gave me this trick. Or I don't know if Polly would like it if I called her an old timer. But a farmer with more experience than I have told me to go in at night and pick them up if you can, if they're roosting. If they're docile then, I said they're like zombies, and it will kind of acclimate them to your handling and being around them. And they'll stop seeing you as a rooster. Don't forget to wash your hands. And this poor little kid got nailed by a rooster spur. They could take an eye out, no problemo. You can remove the spurs too and clip them if you feel that's an advanced issue. Let me know if you'd like to talk more about that. Um, yeah, my sister has a scar on her cheek. She has an extra dimple because of a, a rooster my grandmother had. And um, you are way too lenient. My grandmother made him stew the next day. So um, yeah. also don't be afraid to do that. Because <laughs> you don't too. want aggression around kids. Yeah, definitely not. And it is genetic, I hear. The, um, some of the old timers tell me you can breed that out of your chickens. So. And what's cool is you can breed your own chickens at home. We actually have incubators you can borrow from Extension that are and Kingston. So if you want to borrow an incubator, come sign it out. We're happy to help you raise your own chicks at home. Yes, you can slaughter. Oh, extension offices have those too. You don't have to go to Kingston. Oh, do you guys have an orange? I wasn't sure. Do you guys have some? Yeah, uh, they or the 4-H program does. I'm not oh, cool. sure about Rockland or Westchester, but um, I know that there are 4-H programs that have incubators, so yeah. they Just may give your, lend them out. Yeah, give your extension office a call. We're here for you guys. We get paid from the state and from other grants and stuff to help you figure out whatever it is you want to do from a scientific basis. So that's what we're here for. Um, yes, you can slaughter your birds. Yes, I think that you should. Uh, it's your decision. Ultimately, I've talked at length in the past and other, sorry, you guys weren't there. <laughs> but I talk a lot about the genuine experience and um, of slaughtering your own animals and raising them from scratch. Not only are you more sustainable um, in every sense of the word, but you're more better educated and you know that animal had a good life before it was um, killed for your food. 
you're allowed to actually kill 1,000 chickens per year in your backyard and sell them. There's an exemption for that. Do you want to get into marketing and selling animals? That's an advanced topic. You should take Rachel's course in the fall or contact your local extension agent to talk to you further about it. But um, these are just some poultry setups. These are called cones. Both these pictures, you put a chicken upside down, you cut its carotid artery, it bleeds out, and then you move on. It's a pretty humane, it's the most humane way I think you could ever dispatch an animal. But again, I talked to you earlier about knowing how to dispatch animals if they're sick or injured. There's other ways to dislocate parts of their neck that are just as handy in a pinch, so keep that in mind. All of this stuff on this trailer and in, in the background of this picture is what you need to slaughter your own chickens. I've done, three of us did 800 in two days. I don't recommend that, it was absolutely grueling, but it is possible for you to do quite a few birds um, with just a small crew, but it is absolutely um, devastatingly tiring. So keep that in mind. So again, if you want to know about the laws, which you have to follow, or best practices, hit me up and I can give you more links to that, or your local extension agent. A quick question from the chat. Thanks, Charlie. Uh, are there any breeds that are good for both eggs and meat? Those are what we call dual purpose breeds, and they typically aren't going to be the best meat birds. These are birds that are going to take double the amount of time to grow out into your meat bird. So instead of eight weeks, they're going to take 16 weeks to become meat. So yes, if you just type in dual purpose chicken, you'll find that. That's what everybody, that's what everybody grew up until the 50s. Everybody had dual purpose birds. You raised them. And most, and, and most of them are, are larger breeds, like your... Yes. Um, Rhode Island Reds or your Barred Rocks because they all, um, they produce a lot of eggs, but they also are a larger carcass to get meat off of. I recommend that as your uh, dispatching of roosters program if you want to go that, that route. But again, like Jason said, they, they don't have a lot of breast meat. Um, the Cornish Crosses are designed for large breast meat, which most Americans are used to. They're yeah. going to have more thigh meat and dark meat. Um, so it's just, you know, if you want to go that route, just know that it's going, your, your food is going to look different. Yeah, the carcass will look a lot different, uh, without a doubt. So a lot of times beginner growers, I have this problem, they get a heritage breed and they have roosters. And these roosters have been running and fighting and playing for the last six months, or whatever, 20 weeks. And they're scrawny. When you, when you actually cut up that bird and slaughter it, it's going to be tiny and not look like the bird, like Rachel was saying, at the grocery store that you're typically buying with very large breast meat. So keep that in mind. My recommendation typically if that happens, make stew out of those birds. Sell it as broth or keep it in home for yourself because most people aren't gonna be interested in purchasing that size bird. What are you gonna do with all your eggs? I don't know, but you should be storing them correctly and washing the poop off them a little bit with something rough. Um, I have a circular that's included in your packet that you can all read about the laws about selling eggs. I'm not a lawyer, I'm not gonna get into it now, but there are regulations for backyard growers and producers alike. Um, but you can always give some out to your neighbors, you know. You can feed it to other animals in your house. You can hard boil them and feed them to dogs or other animals. What you shouldn't be doing is feeding them back to the chickens. If you crack eggs in front of birds and they see you do it, they will learn to break open eggs and eat them themselves. Also, if you have a really severe calcium deficiency in your birds, if you don't have access to pasture and they can't eat bugs, and if they don't have any calcium, um, they will actually eat the eggshells to get that calcium. So just keep that in mind. But if you are gonna sell eggs, check out the circular from New York State because there are very special laws. And quite honestly, you probably should have some liability insurance because you now are in the realm of putting something in someone's body that can make them sick. And if it was, if let's say they had some spinach and some chicken that day and your chicken got them sick, they're probably gonna blame the chicken and it probably was actually the spinach and then you're gonna have a bad time and probably get sued. So don't mess around the legalities of this. Um, get at me if you, again, if you're gonna do marketing, contact your local extension agent or me and we can talk about the realities of what you need to do to feed people. Ashley! Hey, hey. So hey, I'm so gonna talk I'm gonna about- Ashley talk about ducks and geese for a minute while we're here because people are interested in that. So I changed your slides a little bit. So just go ahead and talk about ducks for a minute if you would and I can advance the slides when you're ready. Okay, great. So um, I really love raising ducks. I don't know, I, um, they're very similar to chickens in a lot of ways. They're gonna need the, the same kind of uh, heat requirements. They're going to need clean, dry bedding. Um, they're they're going to be a lot messier though than chickens. And so one thing you can do is keep your feed as far away from your water as you can because they're going to like mix those up and make them really messy. Um, I think maybe Jason had some slides too where it showed like elevating the feeders, you know, elevating water so they're not getting in them as much. And that's going to especially be a problem with with your ducks. They just want to do that. Um, they can be trained to the nipple waters like you see here on the upper right hand corner. Um, and that can help cut back on some of the, the messiness that you can have. Um, 
it's going to depend on like your ambient temperature, or the temperature outside, when they could leave the brooder. But in general, it's going to be similar to the chickens again. So about two to four weeks, again, depending on how warm it is, what season you're in. Um, so do they, need a, do they need a tub of water, the birds? They do not. They do, um, you know, so I've heard different things, like uh, they, they are okay with the nipple waters, but I know they do like to like wash their bill and stuff in, in the water. So I do provide something for them to like get their bill in, but, um, but they, they don't like need, need it. You know, I think they do enjoy it though. Yeah. Cool. Yeah. Um, um, there are some meat breed or some land ducks, as I call them, muscovies down there, right? Yeah, yep, yep. And they're different too because they can perch in trees and everything where these other birds are not really going to do that. Um, okay. And our ducks, just like the they're chickens. They're not a true duck, right, Ashley? Yeah, uh, where they're South American, right, Rachel? You can. You yep, but they're, they're not considered a true duck. Okay. Yeah, please, please expand because I, oh. I'm not a muscovy expert. <laughs> <Sorry. laughs> oh, no, I just read up on them. That's all. <laughs> um, they're not, they are, for lack of better terms, not really having their own category. We put them in the duck category, but they, um, they roost up in trees, like Ashley said, um, and they don't actually quack. They, they have like more of a, a hissing noise and um, they actually aren't big fans of water. So, um, you know, they always say if it, if it quacks uh, and walks and quacks like a duck, then it's a duck, but it doesn't. We just still call it a duck. <laughs> yeah, no, awesome. And they have kind of that lumpy, like, weird looking face. Um, so that's one way to you can yeah. differentiate them. Uh, and they're a really popular breed for meat as well. Um, so just like Jason talking about the chickens, how we have breeds that are dual purpose, egg layers, birds that are for meat, the same is true for our ducks. And so this is a list of breeds that you may have an interest in. And um, as you can see here too, some of these breeds are laying even more eggs than what a laying hen would lay. So if you look down like the Campbell, uh, khaki Campbell is one that you see often, and 200 to 300 eggs per year. So wow. really pretty in insane. Um, the only thing though, they're less likely to, leave them in a nest than like a chicken like a chicken goes and she goes to her nesting box for the most part sometimes they're going to be hiding them somewhere but but most of the time you can kind of know where you're going to get your eggs where the ducks aren't always as good about that um i've heard of them like even you know if they're around a pond or something even laying them in the water just kind of laying them more happenstance and so uh that's just something to be aware of but but yeah they can definitely rival the production of laying hens laying chickens so, so that's kind of cool we talked a little bit about processing and slaughter and chickens tend to be pretty easy but ducks are waterproof right yeah and so that's important so um when you're getting your ducks uh so i raised some pekings last year and when i talked with my butcher he's like bring them here as close to 49 days as you possibly can because yeah. after that they're gonna continue like their molting cycle and then it becomes difficult to um, get them plucked really well. And so uh, it's close to 49 days for the peaking, or yes, for the peaking. And um, again, working with your butcher, that can be a problem. Like, like Jason mentioned, uh, you know, processing, not everyone's willing to do ducks because of the added time. And they're going to be more expensive to process in most cases than a chicken would be. Like, like to, to, typically, I think a chicken costs about $3.50 to have someone slaughter it, you bring it to them. But most ducks are between 12 and $15 each because they're that much harder. Yes, yeah. And my butcher did a fantastic job, but you still see like a couple little feathers, more, more so yeah. than the chicken, you know, and it just, he wanted to make me aware of that in advance, like that this can just happen because they're so much harder to pluck. Yeah, yeah, cool. <clears throat> Um, Oops, let's let me see. go forward here. So they really also like definitely rival the, the chicken in terms of growth. And uh, so 49 days, that's pretty close to what you would be getting with that Cornish cross chicken. And that's for the peaking. That's like the equivalent of <laughs> the Cornish cross. Okay. Um, so yeah, so ducks, they, like I said, they can be very messy. Uh, I raised mine on pasture and they did just like, it's just wet liquid poop. Where the, the chicken, it's a little more like solid. The <laughs> duck, it was just like liquid poop. But you know, again, great for adding nutrients to your pasture, but just something to plan for. Um, yeah. yeah, the bottom left again is that Muscovy duck. Uh -huh. And uh, bottom right and the on the right side pretty much are peakings and just different ways of raising. So the top is like kind of a commercial, you know, large scale setting. 
again, the deep bedded packs and um, the bottom is, you know, your home flock. So they have a little thing here to swim in, you know, hang out and get some shelter. The cool thing about ducks too, I think, is that uh, they're really easy to move. So I recently toured a large farm, like the one in the top right hand corner. They said when they're ready to process them, they just herd them onto the trailer, just like walk them on. They're, they're easy to move around. They're pretty easy to work with. Um, where I know when I'm grabbing my broilers to take to the butcher, like I usually wait and do it at night, like Jason said, because they're, they're calm at that point and I can grab them. Um, but they, it is a little maybe more challenging than the ducks. The ducks were so simple to, to, to move from place to place. Cool. Uh, we were, I think we got through all this. Yeah, so yeah, a ton of eggs. Um, oh, slightly larger. Their eggs are slightly, slightly larger, yeah. but they're probably gonna consume a little more feed. Um, but they'll also forage more. So, you know, if you're allowing them to forage, that can make up for that increase in feed. Yeah, cool. Geese, we'll talk about these real quick too. Oh, and, and ducks, um, eggs, Ashley, I don't, I'm sorry if you already said this, but ducks eggs are really good for um, baking. And actually they're pretty creamy and tasty in general. Hmm. Yeah, yes, yeah. And they're, they're really great. Like I fried some up and the shells are like waxy and hard. Like they're just like a cool, th yeah, they're really great. Definitely great. And I think I was just at the store and I forget how much, but they were, they were at least double what chicken eggs cost. So again, finding that market might not be, you know, as straightforward as chicken eggs, but you know, it's, it's something that's not as easy to find either. So you could fill a niche potentially. Um, <laughs> So geese, uh, I think, are super cool. Uh, so there's broiler type geese that can reach nine pounds in about eight to nine weeks, or a heavy type goose, which can reach 12 to 14 pounds in about that many weeks, in about 12 to 14 weeks. So they can consume larger quantities of grass in their diet, up to 50%, but they're not necessarily able to um, digest it better. They just consume a ton and then it, you know, they just keep consuming it and that can make a larger portion of their diet as well. Um, again, strong flocking instinct, easy to move around. Um, and I've, I kind of honestly forget if I talk about aggression later, but the problem is like I have some geese at home and um, yeah, perfect. <laughs> this, there, so if I had close by neighbors, I would not have geese. Uh, I just got a little roommate. I shouldn't say little. I got a, a young, young man roommate for the summer. He's a college student, really great. The first night he moved in, uh, I just, I don't, I was like, I'm so sorry, Pete. Like all night, I just heard the geese honking, like middle of the night. Like, I don't, <laughs> I don't know what they're doing. So they're loud. Um, they chase him. They don't bother me. I raise them. They're, they're totally fine, but they can be very aggressive. They chase my dogs. I have um, German Shepherd dogs. So they're like between 60 and 80 pounds. They chase the dogs. They like ran one of my puppies. Like, <laughs> like they're, they're dominant animals. Um, that said, they're also that can be to your benefit if you want a guard animal so since i've had my geese there i've had a big reduction in predator problems with the chickens wow. so that that is one good thing but um but yeah it's definitely problematic if you have a lot of people coming to the house that kind of thing because they at the very least they're going to be loud i had a guy coming to buy meat one time and wanted to see everything and they just followed us i mean probably for like an hour they just followed and like <laughs> and honked so cool yeah. Slide for you. I'm not sure. Okay. Thank you, Ashley. Uh, yeah, there yeah. I want to get at real quick. One was, uh, do you need to refrigerate your eggs in the U.S.? Yes, they recommend that you do here. Um, like I said, I'm not with the ag in market, so I can't really tell you exactly what to do. But um, yes, you're supposed to store them in the fridge at refrigerated temperatures. And if you do wash them, especially if you wash them, and then if you do wash them, use something just to scrape the manure off them if you're not eating I'm going to I'm going to chime in Jason um if you are planning on selling your eggs which I think this is backyard yeah. poultry so production yeah. poultry is more that route so for backyard purposes um yeah you do with your eggs what you will if you're from a country where you normally don't refrigerate them and you're just doing this in your own house then it's up to you um but for sales purposes you do have to refrigerate them and you do have to clean them um thank you but yeah, like I said, you know, what, what happens in your house happens in your house. Yeah. So make sure if you are going to go to the marketing route, if you're going to sell anybody to, anything to anybody, talk to me or Rachel or Ashley or your local extension agent to guide you through that process and liabilities. Um, the other question I had was following animals behind cattle. I've done it extensively. I have a large ranch. I've never had luck with it personally. I have a really bad um, fly problem and I've followed chickens for multiple years 
uh, never had a decrease with the chickens. But that doesn't mean it's not a great way to lead or, lead or follow animals. It can work really well for you. Um, if you want to learn more about that, get at me and we can talk about it. I had another question I saw. I said, do guinea hens lay eggs? Well, yeah, they do. How else are they going to make more little guinea hens? But as far as exotics go, and these are all exotics, I'm going to tell you to wait. Guinea hens, I think guinea hens are probably even louder than geese. They're extremely loud. They're the guard animals of the farm. They eat tons of ticks, no doubt, but so do chickens. Um, and, but they tend to roost on top of your roof. They're not going to flock as much as chickens. They're harder to catch. Uh, you can raise pheasants, but they will kill each other unless they're wearing blinders. You have really low numbers. The one on the bottom is a naked neck chicken. Those are actually pretty common for meat. Peacocks are extremely expensive. And this all black bird is the Ian Cremini, I think it's called. Yeah, they, it's a chicken. It is actually, I'm surprised you have it under exotics, but. It is, a, you're right, but it's exotic because they were costing between two and 3,000 a breeding pair. They're down to five or 600 bucks. But again, don't, make, don't buy these animals and make mistakes with them. And then like with everything that's a new livestock, there tends to be kind of a pyramid where the people who are in it first selling these type of chickens can get $2,000 for a breeding pair, maybe. But then six months down the road, when they sold 500 breeding pairs, you're not going to be getting that kind of money. So just remember, if it sounds too good to be true, it probably is. If someone's selling a really exotic animal for a lot of money and telling you you can do the same thing, I would take a step back and really think about it uh, and see if you can sell one first before you end up buying them. That's a good point. And, I didn't realize that that is a chicken. <laughs> and peacocks are very loud, very mm -hmm. loud. So yeah, just wait, hold off, and don't spend all that money before you even find out if you can stand the stale of chicken poop on your hands or if you enjoy having these animals in your backyard. If you don't, it's okay. Just move on to something else in a responsible way. That's it for this. So. Real quick, I'm going to go through and send you a resource page and some links where you can get all kinds of information from CCE. Keep in touch with us. You have my email. and I'm not going to end it yet. Don't worry. Check out our web pages. You have my email. Find a mentor if you want. And then give back to CCE. We are here for you. I want to say, Charlie, for giving me this slide. There's a couple links on here, and I'll send you links to Ulster, Rockland, to Albany, and to Orange County, to all the people that are involved in here. We do all kinds of livestock program. The reason this happened is because people want to become more sustainable in these, in these times, and I don't blame them. Um, raising your own animals for food and for other products is a great way to understand agriculture, understand living systems, and understand how you are still alive and how you can give back. So tell your elected officials how much you love them. Tell other people about our courses. Typically, this course costs money, but we're doing more now. We're going to be doing a pet course and livestock course on Corvid specifically, but we do, I do the pig course. Um, Ashley, do you do a course? Ashley does all kinds of stuff. I know that Rachel does the chicken course specifically at Cornell Small Farm. So we have your back, we got you covered. Keep in touch with us, get on our mailing list so we can tell you more about what we're doing and tell other people about it, because it's important. If you would like a certificate, I will send you this if you like, or maybe I'll put it in everyone's packet. You can write your own name in it, saying that you're now an official backyard chicken grower. This is proof if anyone asks. Also, if you would like someone to talk to your local council or zoning board about the uh, advantages to having chickens and learning about these life systems in your own backyard, I'm happy to do that for you too. Um, yeah, any of us can do that too. I've, I've done it for villages in my county and also I did a chicken talk to the town of Chappaqua in Westchester. But, um, and real quick, I did put my email, this is Rachel, I put my email also in the chat um, and Jason, there was a question. I'm just going to address it real quick. There was a question about having chickens and ducks together. Um, and you're also getting a whole bunch of um, questions, including turkeys. Um, if you are going to put poultry together and raise them together, just keep in mind, again, the, the whole uh, biosecurity and um, disease issue because uh, chickens can be carriers for things like uh, they can be a carrier for a disease that will kill turkeys if you have them together. Um, and also there, and, and vice versa, there are other uh, poultry that will carry things that might kill chickens. So it can be done. There are people who swear by it. There are people that have, you know, never had any issues. But um, I just have to put that warning out there that, you know, you just need to be careful what you're doing and make sure that you are, um, you know, you're, you're monitoring for any type of disease. There's a couple more questions real quick. Do chickens, geese, and ducks on pasture do well together? They do okay, but again, biosecurity says you need to be really careful about sharing any diseases. An in-ground pool. If we let the chickens on our property, should we only let them area outside of the pool? Yes, they will go into your pool. They're also pooping it, so they really should not be around your pool unless you enjoy swimming with manure. 
And they will probably drink that water and it's not very good for them either. Are there quiet breeds? Rachel and I differ in this. I think there's more difference within a breed than between breeds. I don't think they're really breeds that are more uppity or more angry. It really depends on how you treat them. I've come from a psychology background. Before this, I was a behaviorist for the Air Force for many years. And as a behaviorist, we believe that you shape a lot of the behaviors that your animals react. So you're causing them to act that way. Not always, there are genetic issues, but typically you can change an animal's behavior by using a reinforcement um, and it works really well. So are there some- but However, there are some that are predetermined to being a-holes and also sometimes their wiring upstairs can, may also not be right just like with people it happens with animals so that is my only disclaimer on that yeah so if you have like she's saying if you have a nasty rooster get rid of it like your grandma used to do um so trying to run through these real quick everybody um so don't believe all the hype about selling stuff if, if they're selling you a quiet chicken i wouldn't believe it someone asked if geese and ducks are guinea fowl they say no roosters i wouldn't mess with it the reason they have that roosters thing is because it's a noise ordinance issue so if you have neighbors that are going to be upset about that, then it's going to be an issue. Maybe you could go talk to your neighbors and ask them about it. Or maybe you could even do better and buy yourself a, a sound meter. And if it goes over a certain level that the town allows, then you will get rid of those animals. Turkeys, I love turkeys. I'm sorry, I did forget about them. <laughs> turkeys are great. They're also one of the best things you can market as far as making money goes in poultry. Because my mother-in-law bought a $150 turkey last year that raised on the farm where I slaughtered. Um, and that's pretty typical for some of the amounts you can get for turkeys. Again, like Rachel said, you got to be careful with blackhead and other stuff if you raise them together. But turkeys are fun, um, but they are about three times the cost of a baby chicken. A baby turkey. And they're dumb. Well, I don't think any animal's really dumb, <clears throat> but you know, I think I'm the dumbest animal on the farm. I can guarantee you that. Um, but Meaning they don't like to live, Jason, that's all. If, if you put an animal in a situation where it can get hurt, you know, it's, it may find a way to do it, that's for sure. And, and uh, turkeys can definitely find a lot of ways to do it. We've bred a lot of the instincts out of these animals, too. So these production animals are not going to have the instincts. And what Rachel's talking about is maybe get out of the rain or maybe move out of the way of something coming at them. Because <clears throat> it's been bred out of them. Because those instincts aren't really uh, in line with making meat, typically. So... All right, what else do we get here? How much on average are chicks? That's a great question. $3 is probably the average. You can get cheaper ones than that and you can buy you know, $20 chicks that are special. What about three bucks is the number. Minimum, of this, you can buy a six at a time. All animals need companionships, they need friends. You cannot have animals alone, period. With chicks, they need the warmth that each other's body provides them. So that's why you have to buy at least six in New York. And that's not really the reason, but you can tell them that. Okay. And the reason that they ship so many in the air is because they need to stay warm while they're traveling through the air in that little box. If you buy 25, you can pay more money for it, but you have to buy a warming pad that goes um, inside with the animals that they ship them. So you can buy them fewer than 25, but it's gonna cost you extra money. So typically three bucks is how much they cost. A local carpenter, nope, I can't give you any suggestions on any uh, carpenters or anybody who does any work like that but I'm sure if you looked online you could find them we can't pick favorites that's why we can't provide those names for anybody um thoughts on wood chips versus sand sand is expensive um you have to have special material to clean the sand if you're going to clean the manure out of it so and wood chips are much easier to find typically but if you have the patience and the ability to clean the sand it can be a great thing to use I like the wood chips because you can compost it though and you make another material from a uh a product that is a uh, that you already used up, that you made nasty, if that makes sense. Old chicken is if the color of it and the way it's bred. As far as I know, does anybody know any different? It's a color thing. Say and that it, again, sorry. What is a mottled chicken? That's just the color, right? Mottled, yes. Yeah, it's just a way you call it, they call animals different things, and mottled is just a different type of color uh, scheme on its body. And then what, what wattage of bulb do you recommend for the coop? They heat lamps are special heat wattages. You'll see that. That's why they can start a fire. They are hot to the touch. They will burn you. If you're a little child or an animal or you put your nose on that, it will burn you just like it will burn if it falls on the ground. So there are special heat lamps. I will put- You also want to get the wattage that isn't going to um, you know, uh, blow your breaker either. So you really have to know what your electricity um, output is as well. Yeah, there you go. So, um, also, Jason, can I just chime in real quick about color because I'm not, this might sound really dumb, but um, for some people, they may not actually know this, but the only difference between the uh, egg colors, like I know some people ask about, you know, what's better, brown eggs or white eggs, 
The only difference is the breed of the chicken. So um, mm -hmm. that's what Jason touched on a little bit about like colors of eggs, what you might prefer. Um, the important part is what you feed them because that's the nutrition in, inside the egg. Otherwise the coloring is, is literally just what breed of chicken you have. And you can tell a chicken's egg color by the color of its earlobe. Look it up and look for yourself. So if it lays a white egg, it has a certain color earlobe. If it lays a red egg, it has a certain color of earlobe. Now you know. All right, we got a couple more minutes for any questions. And Rachel and Ashley are here too. And Charlie's here too to help us. So what else you guys got? And if not, please email us. Get in touch with Extension. Let us know if you need help. That's why we're here, everybody. This is a great turnout too, by the way. I want to help you become more sustainable and I want to help you understand agriculture and life systems in general. That's my job. So please get at us if you need any help with anything because that's what we're here for. And Extension does a lot more than just livestock. They do all agriculture, wrap relatives as parents program. They do a lot of food and um, nutrition work um, as well as any other thing you can think of. Oh, 4-H, of course. <laughs> so please get at us. We're going to end this up here. Oh, we got one. I have a question. Yes, and, James, go ahead, bud. And that's in regards, to, in regards to heat plates or heat lamps, which is the preferred? Uh, I'm a late check-in, so I don't know if you already covered that. We did talk about it. Ashley, do you want to answer that? You know, I, I've been using the plates, but to be honest, I feel like I lose a couple more chicks under them than I do the heat lamp. And I don't know why that is. Um, the one thing they like to do under the plate is they like to touch their back to it. So one problem I had in the beginning was the legs are adjustable and I had it adjusted a little too high. And so they were really having to like kind of stretch out to touch their backs to it. And so just um, that's one thing if you're using the plate is to kind of observe them if you can and see that like they kind of, you kind of want them to scoot under it and it to be maybe a touch lower than you think, but like you don't want them cramped either. So it's going to be, you know, something that you're going to have to play with. Um, but you know, the heat plate's a lot more expensive too than, than probably the lamp in terms of like the, the cost of the actual equipment. And again, depending on the size, you know, so they have all different size plates uh, that you can use, but I think in general, it's gonna be more expensive. Um, yeah. But you know, I think maybe a little safer, you know, uh, they, that's one of the, the reasons that they, they recommend them is that they're um, mimic the mother hen and lower electricity input, and then they're a little safer. But so I think it's really six of one, half a dozen of the other, positives and negatives with both. Yeah, it's definitely a, it's definitely a money issue overall, too. Right? Yeah. yeah. Um, someone asked me if chickens come back home at night. And yes, they do, actually. They roost. They come home to roost every night. Um, when you get new chickens, though, I didn't mention this, and I don't know if anybody else has anything on this topic, but I usually lock my chickens if the temperature allows me to. If it's super hot, I can't do it. But if I get new animals and they weren't raised there, I will lock them in the coop for like two days with food and water so they know that's their home. If you have movable coops, often what will happen is... <laughs> You move a coop, if they sit in there for two weeks and you move it, they will go back and nest on the ground where the coop was before. It's all magnetic, it's up here. So the best thing you can do is, if you see that happening, bring them to the new spot or give them time in the new spot overnight or over a day to get to know that area and how to get back to it. Like I said, they're using magnets to get back to their spot. Uh, yeah, go ahead. Composting the waste, can you put that in a regular compost pile or is it gotta be treated a different way for composting it? Nope, just make sure you're gonna need a lot more carbon though. So keep that in mind. Because, you know, that's really hot as they say. So you're gonna need a lot more carbon to soak up that nitrogen to do it just right. But yeah, absolutely can. Thank you. Um, when should you be worried about pasty butt? Pasty butt is when you have young chicks and the temperature is off or their food is off or they're stressed and the manure sticks to their cute little tiny little feathers on the back end of them and it literally will block them up from going to the bathroom. I would be concerned about it anytime I see pasty butt. If you see pasty butt on your animals, you need to treat them. You need to get some, wet your hand or get some oil and slowly work that manure off their back end so they can actually use their back end as it's supposed to be. So yeah, I've actually had, I've had that experience with a chick before and we did, um, we used a, a warm, wet paper towel actually, but you do have to be careful with the paper towel. Um, and uh, yeah, like Jason's saying, treat it as soon as you can. Um, and I'm happy to report that that little chick is now a three-year-old rooster who has outlived the rest of his, uh, his uh, litter mate, <laughs> litter mates. So we have a question. How realistic is it to be a weekend chicken owner? I would say that's not realistic. Again, I, you know, part of being a farmer and being in touch with animals and ag is being part of it every day. 
And I don't know, I don't really know how you could raise chickens just by doing it on the weekend because ethically you need to see those animals every day. But if you're not taking care of them, seeing them, you're gonna have to pay somebody to. I, I would just to find a friend that has them and visit them on the weekend. There you go. That's a great idea. Go or go to your local farm that sells meat and meat birds and check it out. That's a great idea. If my town doesn't allow it, how can I fight it? Well, let's start with becoming educated, which is what we're doing now. And then talk to me and we can kind of plan a route of what we want to do about that. Not every town is going to allow it. So, but we can definitely do our best to educate those who don't know about the benefits and realities of owning chickens. Oh, all right, you guys have our contact. Thank you very much. Please get at us. I will put all of our contacts in the end. I have your emails. You'll all get an email from me this week. And uh, have a great night, everybody. Please stay safe and stay home. And learn about chickens. Do some reading tonight. I'll email you all tomorrow. Have a good night, everybody. Thank, Thank you. you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.